Okay, uh, so I, I work at the Warsaw University, well, I'm sorry, and this is actually, yeah, let's move on. Uh, this is the list of my, uh, so, uh, this is complicated. That's, that's the, these are my collaborators and some of them are here. Uh, Chris and Kasia, my PhD students, but uh, there's a bunch of people involved in this research. In particular, the Ogle team, uh, which um, is, is taking data for this, for this particular project. Uh, so dark matter does exist. I hope I don't have to convince you about that. Um, this is the uh, one, one uh, fourth of the mass of the universe is, is um, composed of something dark, uh, massive, not luminous, Mm, but actually we don't know what it is. We know it is there, we don't know what it is. I'm not going to mention dark energy, which is even more complicated, but uh, dark matter is already a significant part of the universe um, of which we have no idea uh, what it is. We see signatures of, of dark matter um, in uh, essentially something simple. Uh, if you just measure the rotational velocity in our galaxy or any other galaxy, um, and you compare uh, from what you would expect its rotation velocity to be uh, at the outskirts of the, um, the galaxy, then this curve should be falling. Because there's essentially less stars, uh, you would assume there's less mass. But the rotation velocity actually stays flat for quite a while, uh, up to really far away in the halo. Uh, so this means that the halo, uh, in particular halo, but uh, it's everywhere, but halo is composed of something luminous, uh, fairly heavy, uh, dark, um, and we don't know what it is. Um, so halo is also composed of these um, trails of uh, debris, um, which uh, are remnants of uh, other galaxies which are being swallowed um, during the mergers, uh, at least in our Milky Way and our, all the other galaxies. So these small galaxies, the other galaxies, they bring dark matter to the halo. Um, so. Uh, there, there are some stars, of course, but mostly the halo is composed of this, this mysterious dark matter. This is a very pretty image um, obtained by the Hubble Space Telescope. This shows the um, distribution of dark matter uh, at cosmological scales. Um, you see these are really huge regions of the universe um, which, are, uh, which are composed of this dark matter. So, uh, how to find the dark matter? So uh, there were multiple ideas. Uh, this is probably one of the very few fields where astronomy um, merges with physics, elementary physics, and particle, uh, partic um, particle physics as well. Um, but uh, so Bogdan Paczynski uh, had his own, own idea in uh, 1986. He proposed that um, if the um, dark matter is in form of compact, uh, compact halo objects, so-called MACHOS, a very nice acronym, uh, then uh, microlensing would be the best method to uh, find it, right? So this is his seminal paper from uh, 18, 1986, where he claims, when, where, where he derives um, the, the whole phenomenology, how to use microlensing in order to find dark matter if it exists in this form. Uh, I'll make a digression here now uh, so I'll show the Polish contribution to microlensing and dark matter studies in general. So we start with some prehistory with Copernicus, um, who was um, essentially Polish, let's say. So Copernicus inspired, inspired Newton, Newton inspired Einstein, and then Paczynski uh, was inspired by the gravitational uh, general relativity theory, and then Paczynski uh, inspired Udalski, who uh, initiated uh, Ogle project. And actually we can go uh, in a loop here. Uh, so, and this is the Ogle team, a uh, uh, picture taken a few weeks ago. So we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the whole project. Um, this is a very unique picture because on, on one picture you can see all members of the Ogle team in one place. Normally there is always someone observing at, at, the, at the telescope. Uh, unfortunately Chris Rybicki was observing at the time so that the whole Ogle could, could gather in Warsaw. But um, as I said, this is a historical picture taken uh, a few weeks ago in Warsaw. Uh, so as I said, we celebrated 25th anniversary um, of the whole uh, Ogle. What, what, what is Ogle? Uh, it was mentioned a couple of times already during this workshop, but uh, I'll do the very basic introduction to it. So this is South America. This is uh, Chile, and somewhere in the middle of Chile, there is a nice desert, um, and there is Las Campanas Observatory. This is the part of this Las Campanas Observatory Mm, which is essentially, this is a private observatory run by Carnegie, 
which has office actually down the road somewhere here. Mm, so in, uh, in this observatory, uh, there is this telescope, which belongs to Warsaw University. Mm, the telescope itself was built in 1996, but the Ogle project started in 1992 with this telescope here, uh, one meter swap telescope. So this is a nice view of, of the Ogle telescope over the um, uh, Milky Way uh, taken by Yuri Bielecki uh, some time ago. Uh, this is the telescope itself. It's a, uh, I would say it's a very simple um, and small telescope, 1.3 meter. Um, but it's, the main thing is it's dedicated. So only Ogle uses it, well, except for Chileans, because they have their share, of course. Uh, so we share with Chileans, but no, no one, no one, no, nobody else. Uh, this is the camera. Um, this uh, per camera in particular was installed in 2010, uh, and th that was the beginning of, of Ogle 4. Uh, so this camera it's, uh, consists of, um, uh, it's, it's essentially uh, one quarter uh, gigapixel CCD camera, one of the largest cameras uh, built, um, especially at, in this time. And it was built by uh, Udalski himself. Um, so, to give you a view of what kind of camera is this, if you take your iPhone 6S and you, you, you buy 32 of these, then you will have uh, an equivalent power. Um, so you can imagine the, the, the observing power of this, of this uh, camera. The field of view is 1.4 square degree, which is decent. Uh, okay, nowadays people can, can go even wider, but this, this is decent for, for microlensing, what we want to do. Uh, Ogle has been observing the galactic bulge and the Magellanic clouds uh, from the very early on. Now with uh, Ogle 4 era, uh, the camera is wide enough, we can afford observing slightly wider areas, so the bulge is covered uh, actually to a very extent, um, but also we cover uh, north and, and south part of the galactic disk. So there's, it's something like 2,000 square degrees here, and there's another 700 square degrees around the Magellanic clouds and the bridge. So the Magellanic clouds are actually very tiny, there, so the, all the neighborhood around the Magellanic Clouds is being covered uh, regularly. So, and that's a typical image uh, taken by Ogle. That's just one image uh, of the bulge. Uh, so in this very image, you see five million stars. Uh, and we take such image every three minutes uh, or even, uh, or, or even, uh, even more, more frequently. And so we monitor millions of stars. Uh, and you heard the, the probability for microlensing is something like of order of few 10 to the minus 6. There's already a couple of microlensing events in this very image here, right? Because there is 5 million stars uh, in this image. Okay, so that was the introduction to the, uh, the, the Ogle project. Um, but coming back to the, the origins of Ogle, uh, actually Ogle was initiated by uh, Paczynski in order to test his, his hypothesis um, of dark matter in, in form of matches. So the idea is uh, that we observe the Magellanic Clouds. Um, the, this is the large, this is the small Magellanic Cloud, um, because they, they very conveniently sit at the very edge of the halo. Halo uh, of the galaxy extends up to 50 kiloparsecs, and this is more or less where these, these galaxies sit. Um, so it means that observing stars here, we probe uh, this volume of the halo, right? The LMC is, of course, larger. Um, so we probe this part of the uh, of, the, um, of the halo. So if there is dark matter in form of uh, compact objects here, we should be able to see microlensing events on stars uh, from the Magellanic Clouds. I will also briefly mention that there, there are people doing surveys towards M31, which is way further away um, than the Magellanic Clouds, um, but the idea is essentially similar. Uh, so how do you find dark matter? Uh, so you use a quantity I think it was mentioned a couple of times already during this workshop, called microlensing optical depth. Uh, th so this is an empirical way how to compute it. Essentially, optical depth tells you the probability for, uh, for lensing. Uh, so how do you compute it uh, from the data? First, you need to find your events, and then you sum, you sum the, their time scales. Uh, you correct for the efficiency for detection, because some of the events, short events, for example, uh, with with kind of medium cadence, you, you are less prone to detect them than the longer ones. And also, very long events are very hard to find if, you're, if your survey is short. So you have to take this into account here, and then you normalize with number of monitored stars and total time of observations. So this is, this is the way you compute the optical depth. It seems easy, but it's very complicated. Mm, but anyway, if the 100% uh, of the dark matter halo was in form of machos, 
then the value for the uh, LMC um, for, um, for, uh, for, for this particular solution would be around uh, 4.7, 10 to uh, the minus 6. Uh, but there is a warning. Uh, actually, soon after all the microlensing surveys started, Kailash Sahu, present here, uh, he published a, a letter to Nature saying that um, stars within the Large Magellanic Cloud, they could be potential lenses for observed microlensing events. It means uh, there, there is, uh, so Kailash has computed that a, a at least fraction of microlensing events uh, towards the LMC should be due to stars of LMC, lensing stars of LMC. So LMC has some, some depth. Mm, and you, you expect that some stars from the front will lens the stars from the back. Uh, the contribution from so-called cell lensing in the LMC would be of order 0.4, 10 to the minus 6. That's fine. If you compare the two, to the two, these two values, sorry, uh, it's, it's like 10%, right? OK, so then people started looking for microlensing events in the Magellanic Clouds. Mm, and then there was a Macho survey. Uh, and EROS surveys, um, and then uh, for, for the six years of data, uh, this is the coverage of the sky, uh, uh, they covered something like a few million objects, um, and so Macho has found something like between 10 to 17 microlensing events, while EROS has found none. Uh, you see that the experiments were slightly different. Uh, EROS used only bright stars, uh, Macho used only uh, all, all stars, uh, so then the, the conclusion on the optical depth, um, and hence the, the macho uh, halo fraction, um, are very different. So the optical depth measured by macho is around 1, uh, which translates then to about 20% of halo composed of machos, while Eros just gave a, an upper limit um, for the optical depth, and hence the, uh, for the macho halo, uh, halo fraction, fraction. These are the references. Um, Dave can tell you more about macho. And I guess Mark and, and JP can tell you more about EROS. Uh, so that was the, the state of the art at some point, And people were really confused. So what's, what's, what, what is it with all these machos? Are they there or not? Um, so as I said, there, there was some discrepancy, a significant discrepancy between the results. So there, there uh, Ogle comes in. Um, uh, so I analyzed the data from Ogle 2 and Ogle 3. Ogle 2 uh, had a small camera, the same telescope. Uh, but the, the camera uh, was small enough, so it only covered the very center of uh, LMC and SMC. Then Ogle 3 um, had slightly larger camera between 2001 and 2009. It covered the uh, outskirts of the Magellanic Clouds as well. Uh, so this is the data I anal analyzed. Uh, and I found two events in Ogle 2 in the LMC and also two events in, uh, in Ogle 3 data. Um, over eight years uh, uh, within, uh, among 35 uh, million objects. These are the events, fairly nice, uh, standard events, and nothing particular about them. But the number, that's, that's, that's what matters. So there were just uh, essentially two, four events over uh, a time frame of 12 years. So when we compare these results with uh, Macho and Eros, these are the values we got for the optical depth, 0.4. Something around 0.2 for Ogle 3. So this number, if you if you recollect Kailash's paper, this is exactly the number uh, Kailash predicted. Um, so it means that uh, the, given the, the the number of detection that we have of of microlens events in our data, we can put uh, also an upper limit on the on the machos. But uh, the conclusion here is that uh, what we find is extremely consistent with self lensing only. So there is essentially no room for matches at all uh, in, in, in dark matter halo uh, towards, towards the, the, the large Magellanic cloud. So if you, if you draw this uh, as a function of mass of the, of the uh, lens, uh, so this is combined results from macho. Uh, so this is their detection. It's about uh, well, 16 17%. Mm, this is the exclusion region here uh, from Eros. And this is the contribution from Ogle. Uh, so at, at a mass regime of around 0.1 up to something like one solar masses, uh, we can push down the limit. Uh, we can exclude um, low mass compact objects from the Milky Way halo, uh, even up to uh, something like 10, uh, 10 solar masses, between one and, and 10 solar masses. But the, uh, this window here, uh, yeah, I have a, yeah. so no matches in this, this uh, part of the mass spectrum, but uh, 
you notice this. Our, uh, none of the surveys were sensitive enough to go to, to push to the heavier masses. So this, is, this window, let's say, it's still open. Uh, of course, we know that um, black holes, uh, they cannot con con constitute of the entire dark matter, but at least a fraction of, of, the, um, of dark matter could still be in black holes. Uh, but uh, we, we haven't seen black holes except this, maybe. You've seen this one. Uh, it's a fairly good, uh, good visualization of a black hole. That's why I, I like to show this. Uh, if you didn't know, recognize this is from Interstellar movie. Uh, but we know they exist, right? So this is the, this is the life um, scenarios for, uh, for nebula, a stellar nebula. Uh, if, you, if you make a, a, an average star, then you produce, in the end, a white dwarf. Uh, this is the path for, for, for our sun. But if you have a massive star, then it goes um, through a supernova, and then it, it turns into either a neutron star or a black hole. So this is known, and uh, people accept that, that black holes should be present. They're not easy to find, uh, but we already, uh, we recently see more of them. Uh, we see the massive ones, um, which, are, uh, which merge. They merge and they produce gravitational wave signal. And we also see black holes plus star binary systems. Uh, these are easy to see because these uh, accretion disks are very luminous in X-rays. So, um, but still, there is very few uh, cases like this seen. There is some like three gravitational waves found so far. So we're talking about you know a handful uh, black holes found so far. This is way not enough, and it's not satisfactory. Uh, so if we, uh, how does a black hole look um, if it, it is a lens? So let's let's look towards the bulge now. Mm, and so this is the lens uh, distance, uh, and this is the size of the angular Einstein radius in milli arc second. Um, so depending on the mass uh, of, the, of the black hole, of the lens, um, you will have different Einstein radii. Uh, so for uh, 10 solar masses, um, you will have uh, good, well, on average, uh, somewhere here, you will have good few milli arc second uh, Einstein radii. This is, this is fairly large. For regular stars, uh, which are below one uh, solar mass, the Einstein radius is below one milliard second. So we remember that the, the black holes produce large Einstein radii. Uh, of course, it's a function of distance, um, but in principle, if they sit somewhere in the disk, they should have very large uh, Einstein radii. Um, so just a simple uh, visualization of this. This is this Einstein radius, um, and the size, this is the, the, uh, this is the Einstein ring, uh, due to a black hole, and if this is the source moving across this, uh, this ring, and the proper motion, the relative proper motion, of course, um, of the source is marked as mu rel. Um, so for, a, for an example of a uh, 10 solar mass black hole at one kiloparsec, this, uh, this will be fairly large. This will be 10 solar masses, uh, 10 masses, sorry, 10 masses with um, typical uh, proper, relative proper motion of five um, milliard seconds per year. That gives you a time scale of two years. So this is just the, the uh, Einstein ring crossing time, two years, right? Mm, so if we plot this for a, a 10 solar mass uh, black hole, this is the time, this is the Einstein, uh, Einstein radius crossing time for, uh, of course, you, you, we, you can have uh, black holes moving at different velocities. Um, so for kind of for slow, fairly slow um, black holes, uh, you expect um, the, the time scale of the event to be within years, right? Uh, unless you have a very fairly fast black hole, then you can go below one year. But still, we're talking about uh, hundreds of days of time scales, right? So the, the, the entire duration of an event is years anyway. So you need, uh, you need long uh, monitoring in order to find uh, any candidates for black holes. And there were candidates already. Um, this is uh, one of the very first candidates for black holes published by Dave Bennett. Um, so you see the event uh, lasted more or less like uh, something like two years. And it, it, of course, you expect this to, to produce a parallax effect. The longer, you know that long events, they, they might show the, the annual parallax effect. So uh, this is good because uh, we need parallax uh, to constrain the, the mass of the, uh, of the lens. So that's one, that's one of the candidates. Mm, this is the likelihood distribution. So this seems like a seven solar masses uh, black hole. There was some X-ray follow-up of this one already, 
but there was no there was no signal detected. That would be fairly nice to see a weak signal. Uh, you expect even a single black hole to accrete some matter from interstellar medium um, to show some, some little accretion. That would be really exquisite if we could detect that, but so far, uh, no luck here. That's another candidate for a black hole. Uh, this is Ogle uh, 1999 event published by Shudemao. Uh, this seems to be a 10 solar masses uh, black hole. Mm, I, I will also mark that this is still the, the largest timescale microsecond event ever found with time scale of uh, 640 days. So far, we haven't seen longer event in terms of time scale. Um, so this is, this is really the, the, the record one. Mm, and here, actually, actually, in the paper, they showed, uh, they predicted the astrometric path, uh, how the astrometric um, uh, centroid motion would look like for such, a, uh, for such an event uh, if the um, Einstein radius was around 11 uh, milliard seconds. Uh, that's another candidate for a black hole or, or a remnant uh, published by Yossi not a uh, long time ago. This shows, um, this, this is actually a binary, which was also observed uh, with Spitzer, uh, but the mass here is about two uh, of, the, of the dark component. It's two solar masses. So it could be a low mass black hole or a fairly massive neutron star or a quark star, something exotic like this. Uh, so. In principle, just doing uh, simple calculations of the stellar populations, we expect that below 1% of micro events should be due to black holes. This is small, but if you take into account that there's 2,000 events being found every year, uh, I'm talking about Ogul alone, there should be 16 black holes every year, right? And I've showed you three candidates maybe found over the last years. So where are they? Why, why can't we find them? So this is the reason, you've seen this equation already. In order to get a mass of the lens, uh, you need to measure both parallax and uh, the size of the Einstein radius, right? So um, as I already told before, you can measure uh, pi e with uh, annual Earth parallax, but also um, using space-based parallax. Mm, that's a fairly new channel. Uh, for theta e, it's more complicated because then you need high amplification events to, in order to detect finite source effects, but this is rare. Uh, or you can use astrometry, as already shown before, uh, with some um, adaptive optics observations, all, or HST, or also Gaia, but I will talk about it in my other talk on Thursday. All right, uh, so um, we, we did the search f uh, within Ogle data as well, Ogle 3 data in particular, uh, which covered eight years. Um, so there were 150 millions of stars in the bulge. And we found three and a half thousand uh, standard microlensic events. This is the map. Uh, these standard events, uh, they look like this. There's no parallax. Uh, you can't tell much about the lenses there. Uh, but it's good to have them because you can study the structure of the, uh, the bulge uh, and the Milky Way in a statistical sense. But then we use the same data set to find parallax events. Uh, the, the, the long events which exhibited uh, some high quality parallax signal and we found 59 uh, high quality events. This is an example here. Um, and 19 of them uh, had a probability uh, of more than 50% uh, of having a remnant dark lens. Um, if we were very conservative um, with a very high probability, 95%, we, we had uh, three candidates for black holes um, and some neutron stars as well. Um, how did we guess that these are candidates for black holes? Uh, we only had parallax, as I said. So we need to guess the uh, size of the Einstein radius. So mm, we did a trick that we used the distribution of relative proper motion uh, obtained by, uh, from HST. So this is the bulge and disk mm, proper motions. So you see they, they are fairly distinct. Mm, if we assume the sources are in the bulge, the lenses are in the disk, mm, that's one of the assumptions. Uh, and then also we assume that the black holes, they move exactly the same as all the stars. Why not, right? They can move only faster, probably. Um, then we can, using the time scale, uh, so instead of the, of the Einstein radius, we can use this, um, this uh, distributions of these uh, proper motions and time scale and, and uh, pi e from the model to, to guess the mass. So that's our best candidate. Uh, so you see the light curve here from Ogle 3. Uh, so this event essentially lasted for entire Ogle 3, like eight years. Well, more, more like six years. So you see the, the influence of the uh, annual parallax here. You see multiple 
um, wiggles. It's hard to tell from this light wave alone. Uh, so these are small deviations, but they are, uh, well, significant if you, if you plot the residual as well. Um, so, so we were able to constrain the parallax uh, very good, very well from here. And then given the distribution of possible uh, proper motions, we were able to draw this mass lens, um, lens mass and lens distance uh, diagram um, where color is the probability given the proper motions. So the most likely mass and distance for this particular event is something about 10 or uh, something like nine solar masses at about one or two kiloparsecs, right? Um, of course, if we are unfortunate, then we might have a main sequence star at seven kiloparsecs Mm, moving extremely slowly uh, and mimicking such a long event. So that's why I keep calling this a black hole candidate. Uh, we, we can't tell this is really a, mm, a, a black hole because we don't have enough infor information. Mm, but also we use the, the information embedded in the light curve uh, on the light of the lens. Uh, so if this is a 10 solar mass uh, star at one kiloparsec, that would overshine the, the source, that for sure. So we can exclude 10 solar mass uh, main sequence stars, for example, as lenses, uh, just the, given the amount of light we see, right? So this is this diagram here. Um, so that, this is how we compute the probability um, that this is a dark lens. Uh, so uh, most of the probability, the density ends uh, below this line, meaning that the, the light we see is, is not enough to explain the mass we, uh, we claim we, we see. That's another candidate, it's slightly less massive. Uh, it's about five uh, at the highest probability. The, the, the parallax is weaker, hence this, this, this diagram is slightly more broad. Uh, that's another candidate, uh, even, well, the light curve looks fairly, very, the anomaly looks very weak, but if you look in detail, there is multiple um, annual parallax effects here. So again, the, the distribution, the probability distribution for the mass and distance uh, indicates this is something like three solar masses, uh, black hole. This is a, our kind of more spectacular candidate, uh, not for a black hole, but um, because the mass here is about 1.5 solar masses, but this is just to show you that here, the annual parallax is extremely visible, extremely well visible. Mm. Essentially, this event started at the very beginning of August 3, and then it was wiggling all through all eight years of the event. So it had five, five peaks uh, due to parallax. It was going up and down, up and down. So this indicates that the lens was nearby, the Einstein radius was fairly big, um, and the, the, relative proper, the relative motion of the source, the lens was coming in, the source was coming in, coming out, coming in, coming out. So hence, the amplification uh, was making these funny wiggles. Uh, this is probably one of the very first, uh, very few events uh, which look like this. Okay, uh, so in terms of future work, what we could do, uh, but I say it's not trivial, what we could do, we could combine now Ogle 2, Ogle 3, or 4 uh, data. The main difference between them is the, was the area they covered, um, both in the bulge and the, the large margin line cloud. Um, so in principle, we have 20 years of data. So we could look for very, very long events. Uh, this is an event from the SMC, which was not very long. It lasted just two years, uh, but that's a candidate for a black hole as well. Mm. So, but if you imagine an event like this, we need to combine the data. So this is something we're working on. Uh, that would be extremely useful in order to constrain the um, presence of find candidates maybe, but probably just constrain the, the limits on uh, black holes of order of hundred solar masses. Uh, the black holes we see in gravitational waves. So that's, uh, that's potentially very powerful and interesting. But we're talking about timescales longer than uh, three, four years. Mm, that's why we need to combine the, the entire data set. Uh, but I say it's, it technically, it's, technically it's quite challenging. So mm, my almost my last slide. Uh, so black holes in W first, let's put it in the context of W first. So mm, the advantages of W first are uh, that it's in infrared, so it can look where there is low extinction. Mm, well, it lowers extinction, ah, wrong. Uh, it can look through some of the extinction, of course, right? Meaning it, it can look into the bulge densest areas where Ogle is blind because there's just dust. Uh, w first would be able to look through this dust and see more sources. If you have more sources, 
you're more likely to see uh, lensing, right? So you increase your, your lensing probability, meaning you're more, more likely to find black holes. This is good. Um, and also, uh, it, will, it will be able to provide you with astrometric microlensing, so you will be able to measure the, the Einstein radius uh, with, with W first alone. But the, the um, weakness is, is that, uh, at least what is planned so far, uh, the, the, the monitoring ba time baseline is fairly short. Two years, as I showed you, uh, it's way too short to find these long events. Uh, and then you won't be able to measure the parallax. Uh, it will be difficult to follow the, these events from the ground or maybe, I don't know, future species like satellites or something like that. Um, so I will emphasize this as a weakness of W first in terms of looking for black holes. If, uh, if that can be changed, that I would be really happy. So to summarize, um, there is no room for dark matter in form of matters below 10 solar masses. That's what we, we think we concluded. Um, above 10 solar masses, there is still a possibility that a fraction of dark matter is, is embedded in, in, in black holes. Um, there is a couple of candidates for lensing black holes so far. Um, essentially, you need parallax and Einstein radius uh, in order to confirm a black hole. Uh, I will talk more about it um, in context of Gaia on my, in my Thursday talk. Mm, then microlensing can constrain gravitational waves uh, like black holes in the Milky Way. This is something interesting and, and new uh, what microlensing can co contribute. W first would be great for black holes, but observing window is, is way too short for that. So uh, I'll stop here. Or in reverse, uh, the events we see, which are long, but if their uh, relative proper motions are higher, it means their masses are even higher. So what we did here, assuming that they, they follow the stellar distribution of the velocities, it gives us a lower limit. It's a very conservative approach. But I agree, yeah, the black holes in principle, uh, they are allowed to have kicks uh, if they're born in, in supernovae explosions. <laughs> well, some of the black holes are born in, in core collapse supernovae, so they, they won't have kicks, right? Uh, but it's still a matter of debate, yeah. But that's a good point, yeah. Yes, uh, it's a bit of work. As I said, combining the, these uh, different data sets is quite challenging because these are crowded regions and you have different CCDs. It's, it's complicated. I've been working on it, well, kind of a, a low, uh, involvement for many years now, but uh, now it's getting more urgent. So we haven't done it yet. We plan to do it. That's an obvious thing to do. Yeah. Right. What I read on the website, it said two years. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. That would definitely make an impact. If, if the baseline is five years, then it's more significant. Then you can see, well, ideally, you would like to have a season each year. That would be ideal. If you could spread these 72 days every year, that would be more optimal for black holes, at least. Let's see. Um, but there's, there's also the geo program where you can propose for the lower cadence observations. Yeah. In the of that. That's right. You don't need high cadence. That's the point I forgot to mention. You don't need to observe every, every 15 minutes. Once a week is enough, right?